air barriers versus vapor barriers. Most professionals in our industry will acknowledge that the concept of vapor control is difficult, so it's not really surprising that there's confusion surrounding vapor barriers. But what's interesting is that the root of a lot of that confusion has to do with some incorrect assumptions, not about vapor control, but about air control and the role of air barriers in our buildings. Most of us assume that our primary interest in controlling air in our building enclosures is related to comfort and energy efficiency. And this is true. Airtight buildings are much more energy efficient and tend to be much more comfortable than leaky buildings. And by more comfortable, I mean that they're more thermally comfortable, they're more acoustically comfortable, and they have better indoor air quality, less dust, less pollen and allergens. These are obviously really important things and we're completely correct to highlight these advantages of air control. But many of us stop there and we shouldn't. Air control is also important for condensation control and that's a completely different design goal related to building durability. So sometimes the air control measures we implement for energy efficiency and occupant comfort perform double duty and also control condensation within our enclosures, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, we sometimes need to make separate provisions for air control that have nothing at all to do with efficiency and comfort. We'll talk about some specific examples of that later. Vapor control is different. The only reason to care about vapor control is building durability. Protecting the materials we build with from moisture damage, usually related to condensation. And that's it. There is no efficiency or comfort component to vapor control. We use vapor barriers for the sole purpose of protecting other building materials from moisture damage. We'll get into all of that in a minute, but I'd like to highlight this distinction up front. We use air barriers for performance and durability. We use vapor barriers only for durability. In our discussion today about the difference between air barriers and vapor barriers, it's the durability component that's gonna be most relevant. But first, we need to understand some basic physics. Let's begin by talking about water and how it gets from one place to another in our buildings. First, water comes in three phases. It can be a liquid, a gas, or a solid. When we think of the chemistry of water, we think of H2O, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. But when we're looking at, for example, a drop of water, we're really dealing with clumps of individual water molecules. I used to give the example of H150O75 instead of H2O, but then I actually looked it up and found that I was off by a lot. It turns out there's something like 1.5 sextillion molecules of water in a single drop. The point really is that when water is large enough that we can see it, there are a lot of molecules stuck together, not just one molecule. Water in the vapor form is made of smaller clumps of molecules than water in the liquid form. This is relevant to us in building design because the materials that we build with can be barriers to water in the liquid form, but permeable to water in the vapor form. This can be really convenient for us when we wanna stop rainwater from wetting our wall, but still permit that wall to dry in both directions when it's not raining. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Before we continue, it will help us to understand how water gets from one place to another in our buildings. Liquid water moves via gravity, hydrostatic pressure, momentum, surface tension, and capillarity. But liquid water isn't our subject today. Water vapor moves via air movement and via molecular diffusion. And this is where things get interesting and confusing. That first part isn't so hard. We know intuitively that even though we can't see it, there's water vapor in the air, and it makes sense that when the air moves, the water in the air moves with it. And what causes air to move? Pressure differences. Air will move from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. But what about water vapor diffusion? This one is a lot less intuitive. Diffusion will occur with or without air. Individual molecules of water will move from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. 
if you take something wet and put it in direct contact with something dry, the dry thing will become wetter and the wet thing will become drier. We can actually measure the degree to which materials will permit this kind of water vapor diffusion through them. We call that characteristic of a material its permeance, and the unit of measurement we use is the perm. Higher permeance materials permit more water vapor to flow through them more quickly than lower permeance materials. Fortunately for us, the permeance of many popular building materials aligns fairly well with our intuition. Stuff like cellulose insulation, fiberglass bat insulation, drywall with latex paint are quite permeable, meaning lots of drawing can occur through them, and stuff like sheet metal and plastic and rubber are impermeable, meaning very little drawing can occur through them. If you were to put a wet towel in a plastic bag and use a rubber band to close the bag, the towel would remain pretty wet. But let's say we poked a bunch of holes in the plastic bag using a safety pin. Even if we poked a thousand holes in the bag, the towel still wouldn't dry very quickly, would it? The plastic bag, even with a lot of holes in it, is still an excellent vapor barrier. It doesn't need to be continuous to work. The effectiveness of vapor barriers at preventing water vapor diffusion is dependent on the surface area that they cover. And a plastic bag with a thousand holes in it still covers like 99.99% of the wet towel. But let's take this a step further. What if we undid the rubber band at the opening of the bag enough to insert the nozzle of a hair dryer? We'd obviously see significant drawing even with our plastic vapor barrier in place. But the drawing isn't coming from vapor diffusion through the holes in the bag, it's coming from air exchange. I want you to take two things from this example. One, air barriers have to be continuous to prevent air exchange. Vapor barriers do not have to be continuous to prevent or greatly reduce water vapor diffusion. And two, in building design, just as in our towel example, wetting or, or drying due to air exchange is much, much more significant than wetting or drying due to water vapor diffusion. In other words, when it comes to durability, air control is more important than vapor control. Let's now return to building durability. We began this discussion by noting that our interest in air control and vapor control has to do with protecting the building materials themselves from damage. Typically that damage is related to condensation. For condensation to occur, moisture, usually moisture laden air, must reach a cold surface. No cold surface, no condensation. To control condensation in buildings, we really only have four options. We can warm the condensing surface. We can prevent moisture from reaching the cold surface. We can remove moisture from the environment by dehumidifying, for example. And we can permit the condensation to occur, but do something to make it harmless. For example, by using less moisture sensitive materials and by providing drying. In building design, we often apply these options in combination. When we're talking about air control and vapor control, we're really dealing with options two and four. In option two, we use building materials in such a way as to prevent or reduce wetting. And in option four, we use building materials in such a way as to encourage drying. Let's look at a typical low slope roof on a wood framed building. Condensation can occur when warm, moisture laden interior air wafts through the roof assembly through joints and penetrations and reaches the underside of the roof membrane. Note that no exterior drying can occur through the roof membrane because it's impermeable. It's important to also note that this will happen even in relatively mild climates. But in mild climates, it usually doesn't get cold enough for long enough to cause as much trouble. It's also important to recognize that roof membranes tend to get very hot, especially if they're black. So suppose we have this very roof construction in Atlanta, which is in the northern part of climate zone three. We'll get some condensation overnight when that membrane is coldest, 
and when the sun comes out the next morning and heats up that black membrane, that water can dry downward. And maybe not a whole lot of moisture-laden air from the interior gets into the roof assembly in the first place. Maybe that OSB or plywood deck is fairly airtight, even without sealing the joints and penetrations, and maybe it's a sunny winter. In other words, maybe we get lucky. But what if it's an especially cold winter? And what if we start running slightly higher than normal interior relative humidities? Maybe because occupancy has increased, so we have more people cooking, cleaning, showering, and, and breathing. And what if we switch from a black roof membrane to a reflective roof membrane? And what if it's just not as sunny? All of these are factors that can stress our roof assembly in the wrong direction. So what we want to include is an air barrier in this roof assembly to keep warm interior moisture laden air out. We also want to keep interior air out of the parapets for the same reason. There are a ton of ways of doing that. In this example, I'm showing spray foam insulation used as an air barrier. I recommend including an air barrier in roof assemblies in all climates, but they're obviously more critical in colder climates. And air control is especially important when the deck supporting the roof assembly is metal. This is because metal decks permit so much more airflow through them than wood decks. And this brings us to a couple of really important distinctions. Let's look again at our wood framed roof assembly in Atlanta. This assembly technically has an air barrier in it already, the roof membrane. And we've even connected it to the water and air control membrane at the wall by running it up and over the parapet. So if all we cared about were energy efficiency, we'd be fine, right? But we don't just care about energy. We also care about condensation control, which is why we need the air barrier over the OSB. The second important distinction relates to the nature of that membrane we've added over the OSB. We know that we need it to be an air barrier, but does it also need to be a vapor barrier? In this case, no, we just need it to be an air barrier. In cold climates, zones, zones five and higher, we will indeed need to include some form of vapor control in our roof assemblies in addition to air control. The reason for this is because much, much more wetting occurs from airflow than vapor diffusion. In warm climates, not enough wetting occurs from diffusion for us to care. But in cold climates, we care about wetting from airflow and vapor diffusion. However, we often get that vapor control from some other material that's already included in the roof assembly. In this example, the OSB provides us with sufficient vapor control whether we build this roof in Atlanta or Pittsburgh. Now, it's okay if you want to pick an air barrier membrane that's also a vapor barrier, but it usually doesn't need to be. This is an extremely helpful distinction because it gives us more flexibility in material selection. For example, using something like zip system on a roof provides us with the air control that we need. We don't need the coating on the zip to be impermeable, but we could also use any standard fully adhered membrane over the, the you know, bare OSB or plywood. Let's look at another example to clarify this distinction some more. Here we've got a similar roof, but the deck is metal. This roof has a vapor barrier, the metal deck. It's a great vapor barrier, and it will work just fine at controlling molecular diffusion. But what this roof needs is an air barrier. In practice, this means including some kind of rigid sheathing over the metal deck, usually gypsum, to act as a substrate for a fully adhered air barrier membrane. Do we care if this membrane is also a vapor barrier? Nope, it can be vapor open or vapor closed. Practically speaking, pretty much any fully adhered membrane we'd choose in this application would probably also be vapor closed, but it doesn't have to be. We could, for example, pick a gypsum sheathing and just tape the seams and not have a separate membrane, just like we did with the zip in that um, previous example. The one thing I'll note here is that whatever we use for our air control really does need to be fully adhered or integral, like a taped sheathing of, of, of some sort. 
As a practical matter, a mechanically fastened membrane like Tyvek or tar paper just won't hold up well enough to really be airtight. In summary, in building design, we use air barriers for performance and durability. We use vapor barriers only for durability. Air barriers must be continuous to work. Vapor barriers do not need to be continuous to work. And air control is typically much more important than vapor control. This discussion of air and vapor control has obviously not been exhaustive, but I do hope that it has brought some clarity to a difficult subject. I cover this much, much more thoroughly in my course, Building Science for Architects, which I hope that you'll consider taking.